Well, good morning again, everybody. So good. Wonderful time. Thank you, Lord. Um, as, as we were just in this time with, with the songs through praise and, and worship, uh, there's a scripture that was coming to mind in Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to share it with you all. And it's a little bit lengthy, and it has nothing to do with my sermon, but possibly everything as we tie, tie the scriptures together. But such a, a great word from the scriptures, and I, I want to speak this out over everybody. The heart of God. This is, at the roots of it, the heart of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, but what, is, but what does he ascended mean except that he descended to the lower parts of the earth? Jesus. The one, capital O, the one Jesus who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens. That he might fill all things. And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. For the training of the saints, of the church, of the body of Christ in the works of ministry. To build up. Why? To build up the body of Christ. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. Growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. When we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. By human cunning with cleverness and the te techniques of deceits of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. Let us grow. Let us mature. Let us be unified. In verse 16, from him the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. I just think that's such a great scripture, such a great portion of God's word that says every person right here, right now, you've got a calling, you've got a purpose. God has a plan for you in ministry, in his family, as sons and as daughters. And a part of that calling is in unity with one another. Isn't that great? Praise the Lord that he's tied us together as a family. For me, that's wonderful. I love being unified to a body and a family where I'm not alone. I've got people who love me, people that I can call brothers and sisters. And this past weekend, I was Friday and Saturday, I was at a conference in, in Welch, West Virginia. It was very good, very encouraging and refreshing for myself and, and the folks that we were with. And, and there was this overwhelming sense of unity where people had come together from different parts of, of the United States, different states, different counties, and, and joining together such a unified love. One God, worship, praise, watch and move. And then we can leave with this, oh, thank you, Lord, I'm refreshed. And I'm, I'm not only leaving feeling refreshed, but I'm, I'm leaving feeling like, all right, now it's time to get started. Have you ever had that? You had that touch from the Lord. He gave you that word, that, that time of prayer, that time of worship where it's not the end. It's just the beginning. I believe that's what 2023 is. This is just the beginning of a new season, a new thing. We're stepping out of fasting. I've gone to Buffalo Wild Wings. I've had my wings. I've overindulged and done everything I've said not to do when it comes to eating and ex the exodus of the fast. And now I'm believing for the fruitfulness of what God has been doing in those 21 days to take shape and pour out this year. We are seeing the work of God this year in a way that is mind-blowing, I believe, with everything in me. That's the word that he's been giving me. It's a year of great, great exploits in the Lord. Amen, church? Um, and, and he uses all things. He uses all. Uh, he just, God is so good. He is faithful. He is merciful. I got to see the Lord work uh, for eight hours yesterday. Eight hours on a road. Um, how many of you know that there is a, there is a, Amelia County, Ohio. It's true. Um, I'm, I'm leaving Welch, West Virginia. I love you guys. I couldn't wait to get back. Uh, I didn't want to get somebody to preach for me today because I feel like the Lord had a word and we're diving into continuing into how to pray and, and that sort of thing. Tools that I believe the Lord's calling and equipping us to, to have, to hold on to and put into practice. And I'm like, I got to get back. I want to share this word. And so I leave at four o'clock. Day, evening after the last session there yesterday and 
And um, we had no signal there in the mountains. And I, I plugged, for whatever reason, I didn't plug in my address. I plugged in Amelia, but there was no signal. I said, all right, well, I'm gonna just going to get out of the mountains and then we'll plug her in. Well, when we get out, we just, me and, and my buddy, we just, we hit go or send or whatever on the GPS and we take off. Um, we stop at a convenience store and there's a map up on the wall, big map, and it says, you are here. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, what in the world are we doing there? <laughs> we're, we're about two hours away from Amelia County, Ohio. And so I got in at one o'clock last night. The Lord, he's so good, man. Got to spend some extra time in fellowship with some brothers and, and encouragement with some brothers. And the Lord just speaking in that time. It was a good time. God can use anything. There's a lot of road time. I got in, I got in bed about 2 a.m. So, so bear with me. But I do believe God's got a good word this morning. Are you ready, church? Are you hungry? I'm hungry, man. So if, if you're tired this morning, wake up. Wake up. I'm here with the purpose, praise God. Oh, uh, yeah, he's good. Lord, I just thank you for your word. I ask that you would have your way and teach us how to pray. Teach us how to be intimate and intentional with you in a way that is so reciprocated that we know you're there with us. That we would sense your presence. We would hear your voice. We would feel your touch and know you're not a far off God. You're in the room. You're in this room. We love you. We give you all the honor. We glorify your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. So oftentimes you're told how to pray. We're, we're out of 21 days where I've, I've been very, um, very informational on, on what it means to fast and pray. So we, we have the what you're, call, what you're called to do, what your purpose to do. Oftentimes we have the what, but we're left without the how. We perhaps even have the inspiration. It's been uh, 21 days and then into the next month of in inspiring worship, inspiring words, teachings, and, and all the good stuff, testimonies. Last week, Joshua Johnson shared a little bit of the testimony of what God's been doing in his heart through this time of fasting. So the inspiration perhaps is there, but the information could be lacking. And I'm saying pray, 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 but I don't teach you how to pray. So as a pastor... With a flock, it's my duty and responsibility to make sure you know how to pray. Amen, church? And so we talked about the Lord's Prayer a few weeks ago, and there were seven steps in, in the Lord's Prayer. And not only the, the, what the Lord's Prayer says and reciting it and memorizing it, if you, if you read out the Lord's Prayer, perhaps it's 26 seconds, for me anyway, uh, more or less 26 seconds. But we shared on, on how to take these points of prayer through the Lord's Prayer God who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, and so on. How to break it down into seven points and apply them as an outline to a prayer life that is intimate, that is intentional, that is heartfelt, that is purposeful, and that gets you into that place where it's not just a scripture being read or recited, which is good. The memorization of scripture and the reciting of scripture, it's important and, it, and it's good. But I do believe that the Lord also wants to take us into a deeper place where the reciting leads us to an intimate, holy of holies, secret place setting. Like he wants to take us into a, a deeper place where, all right, now, now let me get alone with you. Now let me spend that time with you and just listen to my voice. And I'm, yes, I want that. And so it's great. We, we've talked about Five minutes, five minute prayer time if you got five minutes. We've talked about 20 minute prayer times if you have 20 minutes. But how many of you realize five minutes and 20 minutes, they're really not that long. You say, whoa, Dusty, where are we going with this? It's not a long time in the presence of God. And if scripture reads out, greater is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, that holds a lot of weight to it. And I want to know and experience and encounter the God who says greater is one day in the courts with you. Greater is one day in the secret place. Greater is a moment in a word that is spoken by you that is so heartfelt that it can transform my mind, renew my soul, bring a refreshing, just oh, that God would speak in such a powerful way that I don't want to leave that place 
It's not just a five minute quick prayer. It's not just a 20 minute, Lord, let me tell you what I need and go on with my day because the work is right around the corner. He is so deserving of more. And in the midst of that, not just him being deserving, he desires to take you to that intimate place. If we're sons and daughters, he wants to spend time with us, y'all. That's beautiful. My son's not a lovey, lovey son. I was talking with someone this morning. They're about to leave for, for a, a, a several weeks, for a few weeks. And, and I'll, I'll see them at the tail end of their trip. They're going to spend time with my wife's family out in Texas. And, and, and my son this morning, for the first time in a, quite a while, I, can, I love going into the room where he says, Mommy, Poppy, the sun's up. It's like, come and get me. I'm ready. All right. I show up. I go in there. My, my study's right across from him. And I was excited. I hadn't seen him for a couple days because I was in Welch. And so I heard that voice and, and like just the father's heart, it leapt within me. My son, yes. And I ran in there. True story. He's in bed. He looks at me. He goes, oh, I want it, mommy. <laughs> Which is so normal for him. I was like, oh, buddy. And I just, I relate me to the father, father God, you know, the father's heart. That was, I believe that's God's heart towards us as his sons and daughters. But I said, buddy, I'm not going to see you for a long time. Man. I'm going to miss you so much. Can I get some snuggles? I, I mean, I'm just, you're going to leave tomorrow and then it's going to be, oh, I'm going to miss you. He's like, okay, Poppy. And, and he just like, he, he dives in and he snuggles with me. And, and we just had this time. Usually he's like, I'm like, I love you, buddy. He's like, Neh. and he just grunts at <laughs> No exaggeration. I know that pastors are known to exaggerate our stories, but that is not, that's how he is. His love language is like grunting and, and don't touch me. But I, I sit on the couch with him and I'm showing him some pictures. We got to do some pretty fun things this weekend, climb some, some hills and, and look out over some cliffs. And, and it was just a good time showing him the pictures. And he, he comes up in like the eagle wing is what we call it. He comes up in the eagle wing. He says, Poppy, I might stay home with you until you go to be with mommy. I might stay home with you. And I was like, okay, buddy. Like, oh. I'll get another play. Like, it was just such a special moment. And it was, it was, it was moments that built up that went from, I'd rather not be here to, I don't want to leave you. And that was done through intimacy. That was done through spending that personal, intimate, intentional time with my son and my son with his father. And I believe completely that's what God wants for us. He doesn't want just a quick passing. Here's my list of wants and needs. It's good, but he's not the, the celestial Santa Claus, right? He's, he's God who he can answer your needs and he wants to, but he also wants to just talk with you and have you talk with him. And so I want to give you some how-to steps. We went through the Lord's Prayer today. We're going we're gonna to dive into another outline that's called Tabernacle Prayer. Um, and, uh, and apply uh, seven more steps. If you've got pen and pad, I ask you to write these things down. Uh, I think they're, they're really helpful in how to and taking prayer and, and getting it to the point of maybe a deeper place than, than perhaps you've been. So the context of, of where the tabernacle was first talked about, it's in the Old Testament, where many of you may know the story where Moses is leading the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt, out of slavery. He gets to the, the Red Sea. He parts the Red Sea. They cross the Red Sea. After they, they cross, they get to Mount Sinai. This is where the Lord gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And, and from that point of, of the Ten Commandments being given, which should have taken a few days of them wandering into the place, what, what took 40 years should have just taken a few days. Where they're there in, the, in what we know as the Saudi Arabia Peninsula. They, they were in this place they called the wilderness for 40 years. Should have been just a few days to get to the promised land. Wow. The Lord uses all things, praise God. And so while they're in the wilderness, while they're in, in this this wandering season, the Lord still wants to spend time with them. The Lord still loves them. And even in the Old Testament, we see where, where God wants his presence to be with, with his children. And so he tells, uh, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, he tells them, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary. Why? 
so I can live among them, so I can be with them. I, I, I want you to know my love. I want to be with you. I, I love that. So God, um, I believe God, he, he's showing us even there, his love for his people. So the tabernacle, I have a picture I want to show you of what the tabernacle looked like, this place that they built. And, and I'll explain it a little bit. I had separate, I had individual pictures for each thing. I thought this would be easier to kind of flip through is to give you more of an outline and, and just look at all of it. So you had this outer court area. Uh, it's is, there's walls that go up, but there's no roof on the outer courts. And you would enter in to the outer courts. And then you had a couple pieces of furniture there. The altar of burnt offerings and a golden lampstand. Or, or I'm sorry, then a bronze laver, which was a, um, it was this bronze bowl where you would wash your face. And then you, you go into another smaller tent that is in this tabernacle area. And here in this tent, there is uh, a rooftop. There is a ceiling and it's broken into two places. And as you walk in, you see two different uh, pieces of furniture. At first, on, on the left there, you see the golden lamp stand that's always kept lit. It's a menorah, if you've heard of the menorah. And then on the right, you got the table of showbread, where, where the bread is replaced with fresh bread every day. <sighs> We're in Amelia. You all know about cooking that homemade bread and setting it out and letting the whole house fill with that. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I remember the first time remembering the smell of bread when my mother cooked it. I was, oh, it was so wonderful. And the piece where they put the, oh, anyway, moving forward. And then there's the, the next piece of furniture. It's the altar of incense. And then what that line is, it's a dividing line. That's a veil. It's a veil and it's spoken of in the New Testament. We'll dive in in just a moment on the veil. And on the other side of the veil, this is the most intimate place. What's called the Holy of Holy of Holies. It's, it's where the presence of God was believed to dwell. It's where only the, the most saintly and holy and sin-free person in the Old Testament was able to enter in. So once a year, this is where the high priest would enter in on the Ark of the Covenant. This is, is where the presence of God was would, would dwell. And, and the Bible says that this was w the presence that went wherever, wherever he went, they went. And, and, and the, in the scripture of, of Exodus moving forward until they get to the promised land, they were led by, by clouds during the day and a pillar of fire at night. And, and then whenever it stopped, they would have break down and set up. It would be this portable presence. It would be this portable tabernacle. And people, that was their devoted job and duty was to set up and break down the tabernacle, this place of worship, that wherever they went, even in the wilderness, that's a good word, the presence of God would be with them. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. But I want to I take each of these pieces. It's, it's six pieces and seven, seven steps that we're going to talk about as we look at a tabernacle prayer and using this as an outline for, for prayer, for prayer. So it's a, it's an old Testament principle and the protocol to the presence of God. Do we need that today? No. Can we use this to help us? Absolutely. I'm so grateful for what Jesus has done and that veil is torn and now as a follower of Jesus, the Holy of Holies is right here. And each and every one of those who believe and call on the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior, that he's placed his spirit within us. Praise God that as a son and as daughters of Father God, the presence goes with us. Amen. And so we can have that intimacy. We can hear his voice. We can talk to him. We don't have to wait once a year. He's with us right here, right now. But when we take these principles, we can apply them to our prayer life and have a wonderful, intimate time with the Lord. So, so the first point that I have is the outer court. You enter the outer court. In Psalm 100, it speaks about this in verse 4. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Say it with me, church. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, thanksgiving and go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. That's great. This is the way you enter in. This is why we start on a Sunday morning with instrument and with worship and with praise that we would enter in, not based on what we're going through, but based on knowing who he is, not based on my present circumstance and situations, 
But based on knowing his presence will meet me here as I praise and give thanks in any and all seasons and circumstances, God's great. Praise the Lord. So enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Hmm, Gratitude. I shared last week a little bit uh, of something hard that uh, my wife and I, I went through in this past year of our life with, with our, our son. He went through some challenges health-wise, and, and it was in a very, really low and, and, and challenging time and season that the Lord began to show me as I would just give thanks, as I would just have gratitude. Still, his presence would be right there. And oh my goodness, what a sweet place it is to know that I can lean into the Father and again, I think of my son being with me this morning, like leaning into, we get to lean into Father God in that sort of way. It's wonderful, man. Uh, last night along, on like hour seven and a half, we started talking about, we've <laughs> just, we're talking through the books and at that point just reaching for conversation pieces and, and the, the song of Solomon came up and I began to think of, of how the bride, be, the bride has this revelation in the Song of Solomon, and the bride represents us, the body of Christ. And, and it's a love story. If you ever get an opportunity to read the Song of Solomon, it's beautiful. And it's about the pursuit, his, the, the groom's pursuit, it, and reminding and restoring and, and share just declaring the identity that the bride has. She thinks she's dark. She doesn't think she's lovely. And he just wrote, you are beautiful, my bride. That's what the Lord believes over us. It's, it's Jesus in the church. And uh, in the beginning, she says, my, my beloved, or I am my beloved's. Like there's this ownership. I just, I belong to him. And then as the story dives in deeper and the bridegroom begins to share this identity and who you are and how much he loves her and, and, and describing why he loves her, the why behind the what and who we are as the bride. And she gets a little bit, deep, about halfway through the book, she goes from, I am my beloved's to, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. She understands, okay, it's a reciprocated relationship. But towards the end of the book, all of a sudden, I am my beloved's, and his affection is for me. It's like, oh my goodness. That's what I believe God desires for us. We go from yeah, I'm my beloved's and he's with me in the workplace and he's with me in the marketplace and he's with me on a Sunday morning and he's with me in the school and he's with me when I'm swatting at my children in the back seat to I'm my beloved's and his affection is for me. He wants to spend time with me. And so he wants us to enter into that place of gratitude, of thanksgiving, of acknowledging, acknowledging this is a love relationship with God. Amen, church? Amen. It's a love relationship. So number one, it's the outer court. We give thanks to God. That's how we can start and outline. That's how we can start in our prayer life by giving thanks to God. Number two, it's this brazen altar. Go back to that picture. You have the brazen altar. Now this altar uh, right here, is, as you get in, it's immediately, it's, it's right there. There's, there's four horns, one on each corner of this altar, and it's the place of sacrifice you see, because of sin, there has always been a necessary sacrifice. And in the Old Testament, there would be an animal, depending on what the, the sin was or, or what the ask was, what, whatever it may be, there was an animal that was placed on the altar. And so the smell, it would be burning, constantly burning. And it would be filled with blood. There would be, you would see this picture of an altar and there'd be blood coming from it that, that was running out. The animal that was dead and it would smell that's just this burnt offering. Praise the Lord that we don't have to do that any longer. I'm serious. I, that wasn't a joke. Like Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus became the holy, spotless, blameless Lamb of God. That means he became the ultimate sacrifice upon that brazen altar. And so you would smell that as you came in. That sacrifice that represented the stink of your sin upon that altar. That's what this represented. But gee, that, now that's when, when I come in on a Sunday morning, every Sunday, minus this Sunday. Y'all went to bed at like 2 a.m. There is mercy. There is a mercy seat. As we, most Sundays, I've been asking the Lord for more conviction. So even in stuff like that, like not every Sunday. Praise God. I'll come through 
I'll come to this altar. And here it's like, it's that brazen altar. But it's, it's, now it's, it's the cross of Calvary. It's what Jesus, the spotless lamb, went on for us. And the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. And here in this place where this brazen altar is, I focus on the cross. This is point two, the brazen. I focus on the sacrifice that was given to me. So I go from this, this, I give thanks, I give praise, and I just start stepping in with my prayer and worship. Lord, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for what was done for me, God, that you made a way in my life that in spite of me and in spite of my sin, in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of what I've even thought about myself, still you gave your life for me. Still, Jesus, you came into this world for me. Still, Jesus, you gave an example for me. Still, Jesus, you died upon a cross for me. Wow. That's love. And so I focus on the cross of Jesus that was born for me. And there are certain verses that I share um, that, that I'll have written down that I'll recite, that I'll go through. I'll have songs because I'm not just talking about a Sunday morning. Take this to the Lord in your time of devotion at home. And I'll have songs that'll give, be about Thanksgiving. I'll have songs that'll be about the blood to help me focus in and, and to set that atmosphere of, of praise. There's something to say about a good vantage point in prayer. You know, Jesus, I think there were vantage points where Jesus would go to when he was praying like over Jerusalem or he was praying over his people. I think there were places that he would go where he could look out among the city and he could see the people that he was praying for. Yesterday, I went to this hilltop and I, would, I overlooked Welch, West Virginia, where, where we're a part, where Love Covenant is a part of a wonderful ministry in a very impoverished, drug infested, dark area, heavy area. There is a light shining out of darkness in that place. Praise God. There is some good that God is doing in Welch, West Virginia. And I got to see it. I got to be a part of it. Some of the women that are in the recovery center there, they were at this conference and you could see like the Lord just transforming. Have you ever seen someone just heavy? And then you see him a little like heavy, like you could see there's weight, there's burden. And then you see him a, a, a few weeks later or months later or a year, however long. And, and that burden has been lifted and you could just, it's like a whole different person. I mean, that's what I felt like I was looking at these past couple days as I looked and, and got to talk with some of these people. And, and I, I'd go to the highest point that I could get to while I'm there in Welch and I'm overlooking this, this community and I just begin to pray. And there's this stirring in my heart. There's something to, to say about an atmosphere that we have opportunity to set. You don't always get that opportunity. But maybe, maybe if you go for a walk in the woods, that's your secret place. You have a trail that you can go through. And, and it, it helps. There's a little place there along that trail where you have your own little brazen altar kind of set up. Where you can, you can see and it symbolizes and it, it helps you focus in on... Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. And it gets you in that certain place. And, and uh, one of the, one of the um, scriptures that I'll share is Psalms chapter 103. It's, it's a, a typical go-to for me in this point. And, and it says, praise the Lord, my, oh, my soul. And forget not all of his benefits. How many? All. Oh. In the men's group, I think in the women's group, there's, there's a time that we take. We call it the blessing roll call. How many of you heard of the blessing roll call? Amen. It is so good. I love the blessed roll call. And we start thinking about the blessings that, Lord, thank you for, for just air. This morning I woke up. I was able to get out of bed. Praise the Lord that I, I have your air in my lungs, that I have a voice that I can praise you with. Thank you, Lord, that you have provided for me today. Thank you, God. And just dive in too. Lord, I'm blessed. What's the blessing? What are you blessed for today? It's easy to think about all the things that are happening and we can get overwhelmed with the worries and the stresses and the hurts and the pains and the things and the stuff, right? Because it's, that, that's, it's all real and it comes at you. But Lord, thank you. It does something to shift the mind, to bring a shift into the way you think where, Lord, I am blessed. I am blessed. You are, your spirit is with me. And you go before me. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of our sins, who heals all of our diseases, whether it's worry, anxiety, fear, addiction, infirmity. This is his word. 
This is the Word of the Lord that is complete, that is absolute, that is sovereign, who redeems my life from the pit. Maybe perhaps you've ended up somewhere right now that you never intended to be. Thank you, Lord, that you redeem my life from the place that you never intended for me to be. Somehow I ended up here, I'm passing through, praise God. You've redeemed me, I'm believing that. Who crowns my head with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And so here in the outer courts, number three, you get past this place and you get to this, this bronze or brass bowl. Uh, it's called a laver. And so it had water where you would wash yourself, wash your hands, wash your face. And one of the points of this was to see the reflection. To, see the re to realize, all right, there's still some work to be done. Lord, cleanse me, my hands, my face. There's still some work to be done. How many of you realize there's still work to be done? We're not in heaven yet. You ever seen like Bridezilla? The, isn't that a show? Like one of those Bridezilla shows where it's, or, or I don't know what they're called. I, I've seen commercials and long ago, I, I remember seeing all this stuff. They're angry though. Like up until the point of the wedding, they're angry and hair's everywhere, makeup's everywhere. You'd think they'd be nice to the bridesmaids, but on this show, it's just, I guess, Drama TV sells, I don't know, but they're like, ah, like just angry. But like the, the, the dress isn't right and just stuff's happening. How many of you realize sometimes that could be a depiction of the bride of Christ? We're a work in progress, praise God. Thank you, Lord, for the, for the mercy and the grace that you give, that you bestow on your children. Oh, praise God. And so it's a, it's a time to, to see like there's still a work to be done. This isn't a finished work. Lord, there's more to happen. Lord, you're sanctifying me. That means you're still making me more like you. I've got some areas that you're still chiseling away the rock on my heart. You're still breaking away the walls that I've built up in life. You're still doing a work in my heart, God, and in my mind that you're making me more and more like you. And I just ask you, God, help me to see. Help me to realize. Give me eyes to see so that I would reflect you. So that my life would reflect your life. That the goodness of God would be what I walk in and the love of God would be what permeates from Dusty or whoever it is that hears me right now. That I wouldn't walk and act and respond in anger and aggression and, and allow uh, my peace to be taken. Lord, give me a peace that is unwavering. Give me a peace that surpasses the ability for even me to understand, but I walk in it because you say that you keep at perfect peace the one whose mind is stayed on you. That that peace would be, be a rear guard. That your peace would guard my mind, my heart, my thoughts, my soul. Praise the Lord. And so I'll go through, sometimes during, during worship, I'll go through and you'll see me acting it out. And you think, that guy's weird. And then I get up here to share and you're like, wait a minute. It's the crazy guy sharing. i got to find a different church. But I'm going to explain it to you. You see me up here, I'm like touching my ears and I'm touching my head. and I'm doing this with my eyes. Just ignore me. Do your own thing in worship. <laughs> and this is what I'm doing though. It's a breakdown and I'm, I'm going through different scripture. Philippians 4, it, it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, on what is honorable, on what is right, on what is pure, on what is holy, on what is lovely, on what is admirable. Think about these things, things that are excellent, things that are worthy of praise. I'm up here, I'm like, Lord, get my mind right. That's, that's what I'm doing. Lord, give me thoughts and a mind that is pure, a sharpness with my tongue that, that would be your word, your voice, your spirit. I don't want to be seen or heard. Lord, get rid of, of all that is fallible, all that is not of you, God, that this church would grow because you are leading us, not dusty. Lord, give me the mind of Christ. Amen? I think we all need that. So, Lord, this is what I'm doing. Give me, give me that mind. As I look into the labor, as I look into the reflection, into the water, wash my mind. Renew me. Transform me by the renewing of my mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Don't conform to the pattern and the ways of this world. Praise God. And get into the renewal of the, I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. Romans 12, 2. 
How do you renew your mind? How does it transform? And it dives in. Think on things that are pure, unholy, and right. And all throughout Scripture, it tells you what to set your mind on. Well, it's easier said than done. Not really. It's easy. But you got to open the Word. You got to be intentional. You got to take the Lord's Prayer. You got to take Tabernacle. You got to do what I'm telling you, believe it or not. And it'll help. It'll, it's simple until it comes to the doing. Because a lot of us have created, and, and for years, have these habits that aren't bad habits, but they're busy habits. And so we say things like, I just don't have time. You don't understand. I understand perfectly and better than most. And we're not even going to get into it. But I love the secret place with my father. And it is irreplaceable. It is priority number one. Because if I want to be a good husband, that better be number one priority. If I want to be a good father, it better be number one priority. There is nothing that can replace that time with the Lord. Nothing. I get it. Sometimes five minutes is all you got. You better make time. Amen? Amen. Lord, take my mind. So then why does he do his ear thing? I'll tell you. I want my ears to hear what God is speaking. There's a lot of clamor and racket and speech and rhetoric and discouragement and criticism in this world. It can come from your closest friend, the one who loves you and doesn't realize, can come from anybody. It may accidentally come from me sometimes. And I apologize for that. I hope not. But I'm fine. We're, we're people. But Lord, I want to hear what you say about me. What you declare over me. What you desire for my life to be in step with. I want to take this time that I have in this world and be influential as you have called me to be. I want to be like Jesus to this world. But in order to do that, I've got to hear what you're telling me, Jesus. I can't believe what this world says about me. I've got to know who you say I am and walk in that identity. In Jesus' name. So Lord, give me your ears. John chapter 10 talks about knowing the difference. The voice of this world, the voice of the shepherd, that the sheep would hear the good shepherd and follow. Lord, let me hear your voice. Give me eyes that I would see. Lord, I want to see what you're doing. I want to be able to look into the life of someone and say, you know what? Let me, let me pray for you. Why are you going to do that? The Lord told me to, and I see there's some hurt in your heart, and I just want to pray with you. Okay. And I want to respond to God with obedience. Amen. But Lord, also guard my eyes. I don't want to look, as Job said, I don't want to look lustfully at another maiden. Oh, that just got serious. Lord, if it's the computer screen, if it's this phone, if it's, if it's the commercial on TV, throw it out, break it down, get rid of it. I don't care what you have to do. Make proper steps to do it. Lord, give me eyes that are your eyes, that I not be tempted. Lord, guard me from temptation. Telling you, the eyes are the window to the soul. If you would get your eyes right, you would start seeing your thinking change. If you would get your ears right, you would start seeing your thinking change. That's how purity happens. Not from religious activity, but from going after God with every part of who you are. Physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, fan the flame, church. Be intentional in your relationship with God. Give me those eyes. My mouth. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 21 talks about having, having a mouth that would speak blessing and not curse. Speak life. Never speak discouragement. Never speak uh, just criticism over some. Speak life. Build up. Encourage those who are around you. While there is still day, encourage one another. Scripture says, man. That's good. May my mouth be used for the kingdom of God to build up and never to break down. My hands were still in the labor. I'm still looking at my reflection. I've got 10 minutes. I want to live open. I want to live an open handed life, generous with who I am, symbolic of I want to be generous in every area of my life. With my love, with my care, with my energy, with my time, with my actions, with my, with my finances. I, I want to live a generous life, Lord. My feet. 
Lord, lead me in the way of everlasting. That my steps would be ordered by the Lord. That I wouldn't swerve or waver to the left or to the right. Like, like King David said, give me a face that's set like a flint. Like I would look directly in front. Back to the song of Solomon. In this love relationship between the groom and the bride. They speak something beautiful about one another. Give, give me dove's eyes for you. Give me dove's eyes. What's beautiful about that is that a dove has zero peripheral vision. It only sees what is right in front of it. I want eyes like that, man. Lord, set my feet that I would walk in that what is in front of me, and I'm going after it. There is nothing, there is no one that can waver me from my walk in you. So, Pastor, why do you do this? Well, I'm hoping you'll do it with me. But Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That we wouldn't make an excuse for the I am the way I am, I do the things I do, I stumble the way I stumble. God will forgive me. And yes, he will. Praise the Lord. He's so good in that manner. But Lord, this is my cry. That I would offer my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And I'm telling you, if you'll put this stuff into practice, you'll enjoy prayer. It'll become an enjoyable time with God. It's not a religious duty. It's an enjoyable time. Psalms 139 verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. He already knows it. It's just your time getting there with him. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you, Lord, and lead me along that path of everlasting life. Don't you want that? Lord, pull those things out. They don't belong there. Pull out, pull out the things that, that don't belong, God. There's, a, there's a, a levity in that. And then we go into the little tent. The tent of meeting, the sanctuary place. And the first piece of furniture, it's the seven-pronged candlestick. It's the menorah, and it represents this, this flame that's ever burning, always burning. It represents the Spirit of God. And what's beautiful about that is now that fire is within our hearts. And, and my hope this morning is that I'm fanning the flame of your heart. That the Lord has taken the discouragement. He's taken the, the stuff that we've been going through perhaps. He's taken the busyness. He's taken the work and relationship. He's taken the religion and he's pulling those things out. And he's showing you there's a flame. It's time to fan the flame. Let's add some wood to the fire. Let's have that thing grow. Amen, church. I'm almost done. Amen, church. Amen. Isaiah chapter 11 says that we invite this. It talks about inviting the spirit of the Lord into your life and the, the different aspects of the spirit of God. Galatians chapter five. I told you, if you've got a pen and paper, write these things down, take it home, chew on it. Galatians chapter five talks about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, joy, spoke of joy in the house of God this morning. Whew. Love, joy, peace. Patience, that's a good one. Kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, long-suffering. Apart from these things, there is no law. In other words, they're all found in intimacy and relationship with the Lord. Not out of mandate and, and mandatory duty, but out of relationship. The more time you spend with Him, the more you become like Him. And all these fruit, that's the flame. Romans 12, Ephesians 4 talks about the gifts of the Spirit. I opened up with the different parts of the body of Christ that we would edify one another, that the unity and the love would be built up for the glory of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says, This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gifts that God has given you. Then on the other side of the room, and there's the room, there's the table of showbread. The bread is fresh every day. It's enticing. 
You ever smell grandma's bread? It's good. It's never bad. It's always good. She's amazing. And that fresh smell, it's entire, it draws you in. Amen, church? It draws you in. It represents a time to feed on God's word. Jesus says, man does not live on the bread alone, though, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is the bread of life. So it's a representation of that. And then you see the altar of incense. Very different from the brazen altar. Brazen altar, nasty smell. Tape, uh, the uh, altar of incense, bed, bath, and beyond. It's the good stuff. Now you're entering in. It's that it brings you in. There's something about the presence of God. It brings you in. It's an enticing smell. You want more of it, and you want to smell like it. Have you ever walked out of Bed Bath & Beyond? You don't ever smell like the way you came. You always smell like a thousand different stuff. Mm, it's just so good. You could walk through there. Your eyes will burn because everybody that's been spraying stuff, is, it's, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the smell. The smells are great. That's what happens when you get into the place of the presence of God. You start smelling like him. The one you've been with. And then finally, it's the ark. It's the ark. The mercy seat. The cloud by day, the fire by night. The nitty gritty to the presence of God. The one who goes before you. The one who's at your back. The one who loves you and will never forsake you. Never leave you. The one who's not just described at love, but his name is love. It's the ark. It's his presence. And so my hope is that as we dive into a deeper prayer life, I want that. We need that as a church. If we want to see what I'm believing and hopefully we're believing as a community, as kingdom believers, as followers of Jesus, not just as love covenant. I believe he's calling us into a deeper prayer life because it's a deeper relationship with him. You've got to get to that mercy seat, that ark the presence of the Lord. Do you believe that church? Can we take this? If you want the notes, I can give you, I hope you take the notes. We're doing some more of this coming up. Bring a pen, bring a pad. I want this to help you. I want you to be edified so we can stand now. We want to pray. And I just, uh, my prayer, Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that, that we would, we would grow in our intentionality with you and it would be so evident because even though there's a heaviness, perhaps, that we've carried, we go into that place and we come out feeling that levity. And then we get to carry that wherever we go. That our families would be different. That we would be different. Our workplaces would be different. Because you're creating and cultivating a difference. May it all happen through a deeper relationship. Draw us into you, God. In Jesus' name, we love you, Father. We love you, Lord. Before we close out, just continue with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Lord, I thank you for your goodness and that you, you became that sacrifice, that you bore that cross, that the brazen altar became living among us through Christ on the cross. And Lord, I thank you for the, what that represents, that now we have mercy and we have grace, we have forgiveness and we have relationship if we simply Say, Lord, I need you. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Take hold, direct, change my life. Now lead my life. Maybe you're in here today and you haven't done that. And so this is absolutely everything to me is that the kingdom of heaven would be opened and your eternity would change forever. And it's all about a heart condition. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, then you will be saved. <laughs> and so I ask, if that's you today, if you want to ask Christ to come into your life, if you could just lift your hand up right where you're at, and we want to pray with you. As a church, we want to pray with you. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, this is me confessing with my mouth and believing in my heart, Lord that you sent your son Jesus to live a sinless, perfect life and to die upon the cross 
so that I could be set free. Forgive me of all my sinfulness. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Change my life. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And if that was you today, I ask you, please get with me after church. I've got some things for you. Just want to talk with you. Love on you. God bless you, church. Also, get with Virginia for the Valentine's dinner. Amen. Have a great week.